Hello, I'm Michael Markowitz, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today, to welcome you to the new school, uh, and to welcome you to the Institute for Retired Professionals, which has been a program at the new school for 47 years. At new school, we develop our own study groups. We're part of the university, but we form a community of scholars together. If you want information about that, there's a clipboard and you could sign in uh, on the clipboard, and we will send you information and invite you to come visit with us at an open house to learn more about our program. These lectures are uh, a result of a bequest made in honor of Estelle Tolkien, who was a student here some decade and a half ago, and who attended many programs here, and her family decided to memorialize this commitment on her part to this wonderful program. Uh, the program is actually uh, a project that's run by IRP students, and the two people in charge of that are Gloria Troy, who's standing over there, sitting over there, and Marjorie La Miriam Lawrence. Today's guest has helped us all to save a part of our cultural heritage. And I'm going to ask Miriam to introduce him and so that he could tell us about this part of our cultural heritage and how it's becoming appreciated now. Thank you all for coming. Well, let me welcome you also to Fridays at One, the first one of the spring semester. Um, and today, it is my very great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Charles Hobson, who's an Emmy Award-winning producer who has been delivering documentaries about African-American culture, history, art, and politics for more than 40 years. And we're working on getting him to join the IRP. <laughs> <laughs> A former Fulbright scholar, he has worked with BBC, ABC, NBC, Core TV, and PBS. In addition to the Emmy, he is also a winner of the Japan Prize Special Citation and the Cine Golden Eagle Award, and has been ranked one of the top 50 producers in the film and television industry by Millimeter Magazine. Among his many credits are From Jump Street, A Story of Black Music, which is a 13-part series for PBS, the Africans, a nine-part series for BBC, the television series Like It Is for WABC-TV, Global Links, a six-part series for, on international development co-produced with the World Bank for PBS, and of course, Harlem and Montmartre, which is the subject of today's talk, recently broadcast on PBS's Great Performances. Um, we are very, very pleased to have him with us today, particularly in honor of Black History Month, so let me welcome Mr. Charles Hobson. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the new school. Please speak into the mic. Okay. okay. Uh, I'd like to thank the new school, is this better? Okay, for inviting me. And uh, I, uh, I'd like, like to also thank uh, one of your members, uh, Ms. Levinson, who I, met uh, on a f uh, flight to uh, Paris. Uh, I'm exaggerating, it was accessory. Right? <laughs> but, but anyway, from Brooklyn. <laughs> but anyway, I will uh, tell you a little bit about the format. Uh, we'll show a little clip uh, that was pr produced for Channel 13 and is running on the web. Uh, and then uh, I will talk a bit about, uh, give you a little bit of the background story, and we'll show some uh, photographs uh, from the period. And then we'll uh, jump into a, a slice of about a half an hour or 40 minutes of the program, and then we'll have a, uh, a question and answer uh, period. Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, Dr. William Shack. I mean, he's not here. Actually, he was the, he wrote a, the book, Harlem and Momart. It was the chairman of anthropology at uh, Berkeley, and uh, deceased. Uh, he he died about I guess about 12 years ago, and uh, his widow. They were actually distant relatives of mine, and uh, so I'd like to thank thank him and his family for making the whole series 
uh, possible. I'd also like to thank Great Performances, uh, Channel 13, and the producers there, because you, know, you don't do it yourself, you work with people, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge you know, those people too. So we'll start off with a little clip, about a four minute uh, clip, that'll sort of set this up, uh, and then I'll come on to confuse you, and then we'll get back to the, uh, the film. Thank you. In the years following World War I, African-American jazz musicians began arriving in the Parisian neighborhood of Montmartre and changed how France felt about music forever. There was the saloon keeper Bricktop, the scandalous star Josephine Baker, the great clarinet and saxophone player Sidney Bechet, and an ambitious entrepreneur and nightclub owner Eugene Bullard. Together with French musicians and club owners, they became major figures in the nightlife of Paris. Louis Mitchell had a tremendous impact on the music scene in Paris. He played at the Casino de Paris and met Miss Tanguette, the famous singer, and her protege, Maurice Chevalier, who were very much taken with this new form of music, which was still called rag, or as it was soon to be called, jazz. And Paris was swept away by this music. They were fascinated with black musicians and black American um, culture, and they wanted more of it. And so, f at first, Mitchell was leading a, a white orchestra in at the Casino. He was teaching them to play rag. And the owner of the Casino de Paris, Leon Volterra, told Mitchell, "You know what? Go back to New York and bring me back 50 black musicians, because we, we don't want French musicians. We want American black musicians." Mitchell um, did bring back five players and they formed a group called Mitchell's Jazz Kings and they were in the Casino de Paris. They played their music for about four years. After playing with the Jazz Kings, he decided to go off on his own and he opened restaurants. And these restaurants were, they were lunch counters. Well, they were kind of a, a combination of Harlem and Paris. So you would have jazz, somebody playing jazz in the corner and you would have all night breakfasts, you know, all these people, they've been hanging out in Montmartre, all juiced up. And then you would go to Mitchell's and have your eggs and your bacon and your grits and your pancakes. And people were lined up for blocks. During this time, Passe Records began to record and they, they recorded with Mitchell's Jazz Kings the uh, probably the first jazz recording. It was in 1922, and um, the, it included the song Ain't We Got Fun, which is a basic um, part of the jazz repertoire. These are sort of notes on the backstory, uh, and there, there are a number of things that. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Would you like me to use the mic? Okay, sure. <laughs> um, I, I, there, there. W w Mitchell actually, we didn't put Mitchell in the final film. I mean, there are so many characters, uh, and he's one that we we had to leave out. So the, the, when the opportunity came to do a small film. Uh, it was important for us uh, to, uh, to, to include him. There are five quick things I want to—I th I think about often when I see the film, as we work on the film. Number one, the difficulty uh, that African Americans, the difficult times African Americans faced here in the U.S. Uh, during that period. You know, it was a time when uh, 
1917, 1916, 1912. Uh, you know, it was a very, very difficult. New York was segregated uh, in, in, in many ways. Uh, and a lot of things, uh, bizarre things uh, happened we had to, had to face. So, uh, and uh, of course, you read the history and you know about that. But Paris uh, presented many, many opportunities. Uh, and uh, and our, being Paris being the world, the cultural capital of the world at that time, uh, just imagine you're an African-American musician. Uh, you go to Paris and... Uh, you know, you're treated, you're treated well, you're respected as an artist in, in the cultural capital of the world, and you could even have a glass of wine, because, you know, we had prohibition uh, in the States at that time. So it was quite an amazing, and, there, and a lot of them were making really good money. Uh, Bricktop made a lot of money uh, uh, during that period. So uh, a lot was going on. The military situation, and when I talk to uh, younger audiences, if there are younger audiences out there, uh, I, uh, you know, they're shocked at how our military kind of operated. Uh, blacks could not fight for the United States. Uh, they were more or less, you know, laborers. Uh, and this debate that raged uh, within the military and, and the U.S. government uh, centered around uh, many Americans did not want blacks to shoot to use weapons because the idea of black soldiers killing German, white Germans was not acceptable to America. So that's why the 369th had to fight under the French banner because the military, again, the Germans that we were at war with, uh, they didn't want blacks with guns uh, shooting them. So that was, uh, and in fact, in training often the blacks trained with uh, wooden guns because they didn't want them to, uh, to use uh, in fact, in South Carolina, there was a major riot where whites were, were upset because uh, they, were, they heard that blacks were, were training with weapons, black soldiers training to fight for the United States. And uh, an Af two African-American soldiers were lynched in their uniforms. Uh, so I don't mean to, to dwell on this, but, but that, was, that was what we were kind of facing. It is also interesting to know that many of the people uh, in, these, in the film, many of the characters, when they returned to the United States, uh, lived in obscurity and, and died in, you know, very poor, uh, although there are some, a few good stories. Uh, so it was quite an extraordinary period uh, uh, for these African Americans uh, who, who were in, uh, in, in Paris. And it's also important to know that the, uh, the French created their own jazz legacy. Uh, and uh, the uh, Swing label was the very first jazz label uh, in the world, all jazz labeled. There was never a record company that played, produced only jazz records, and that was Swing uh, in Paris, and they recorded some, uh, some, some classics. Uh, the, those are those quick notes, but the, the period we're looking at, 1919 to uh, 1949, it's that 40-year uh, year period looking at uh, how the musicians thrived, and then there were downsides too, there were problems. Not everything was perfect, and of course we don't forget about the French colonies and how they treated uh, the, the Africans that they, that they, uh, whose lives they controlled. But there was a lot of opportunity uh, in Paris uh, for, these, for these musicians. Josephine Baker, uh, and uh, who I'm sure everyone Everyone knows Josephine Baker, right? <laughs> uh, and she was often called the Bronze Venus. Uh, and uh, she, she did walk around uh, Paris with that cheetah, you know? <laughs> so so that, was, that, that, was, that was real. Uh, and she did a lot of things. But, uh, but even during the war, I guess many people are aware that she was the first American woman to win the highest military award uh, from the French. Uh, for her activities and the intelligence uh, during, during World War II. Um, Sidney Bechet, uh, we'll get back to these people in the film, but I just wanted to give you a little snippet. Uh, the uh, genius, troubled uh, genius, uh, who actually got in trouble in Paris when he shot another musician, shot at another musician and wounded a by bystander. He spent about two years in jail, but He's better known for being one of the greatest soloists in the history of jazz. I mean, just a marvelous, marvelous musician. Uh, Django Reinhardt, uh, uh, the uh, 
actually a Belgian-born uh, gypsy uh, who, uh, in a fire, uh, his hand was damaged, his left hand was damaged, and he uh, two, lost two fingers, uh, and developed a style of playing uh, which was almost incomparable. I mean, everyone agrees that he's the greatest uh, jazz guitarist that, that ever lived, uh, really. His records are absolutely uh, amazing. Uh, and this is a uh, scene in uh, a nightclub uh, in, uh, yeah, this one, yeah. Going back, uh, Bricktop, who is called Bricktop. She's the sec person, the second on the left. Uh, born in West Virginia, grew up in Chicago, actually sang with the Jelly Roll Morton group uh, and uh, was able to open uh, and run a bunch of, uh, a bunch of clubs. Uh, very, very important, and uh, you'll hear in the film how the Duke and Duchess of Windsor hung out at her her club. And uh, it's some. It's actually interesting that uh, one of the reasons uh, the French French intellectuals were able to look very seriously at jazz, and as early as 1925, there were academic journals were discussing a jazz as an art form, was because. Um, when high members of uh, high members in the uh, in the government uh, and royalty and the, the socialites accepted jazz, uh, it was then the subject could be the subject of serious uh, scholarship, and it was uh, the subject of serious scholarship. Nothing like this happened in the in the United States. Again, this is uh, this is like during the uh, during the twenties. Uh, I'd like now to. Uh, begin uh, show, okay, Bullard. Uh, this, this for me, uh, this was, I, I didn't know anything about this man until, uh, this will, until I started working on this film project. Eugene Bill, Bull, has anyone here, did, no, does anyone know the name Eugene Bullard? Has anyone, yeah? Okay, great. <laughs> he's, he's one of the most important uh, stories, one of the most important figures, uh, really, I think, in all of 20th century, uh, African American history. He uh, uh, was born in Georgia, and uh, at about f age 14, stowed away uh, to Germany on on a ship. And uh, when he got to Europe, uh, he then uh, he actually became a boxer just to earn whatever he could do to earn a living. And uh, he was part of the Jack Johnson entourage uh, as a fighter. Ultimately, got to France, and uh, in Paris, he picked up the language really well. He also picked up German. And in France, uh, he was able to, uh, had to join, decided to join the uh, Foreign Legion, the French Army in World War I. And he fought as a foot soldier and was wounded. Recovered, went back again, was wounded again. This time he wasn't able to go back. He then, on a bet, uh, bet someone that he would be able to join the French Air Force. And he was sure enough, because of his great training and fighting, he was accepted in the French Air Force. He was the very first African-American black pilot in the world. He flew successfully for the French, you know, uh, shot down uh, German planes and uh, really became a French uh, war hero. Uh, after that, he, he married into a French, a ro you know, uh, upper class, a royal, uh, her fa father-in-law was a count and uh, had very good connections in, in, the, in the Air Force. Uh, and then he was the one who started, who brought Bricktop over uh, for that restaurant, which then you you, you hear about, uh, and in the restaurant, Langston Hughes was a dishwasher, <laughs> and and Bo Jangles, uh, who was there because he was in the 369th Army, Bo Jangles uh, worked also worked in the restaurant. Bullard was quite an extraordinary man. His story goes all the way through uh, to World War Two, World War Two, where he rejoins. But anyway, you'll hear more about that uh, in the film, but we can talk about that. Uh, this is uh, Lewis Mitchell and the, and the Kings. Lewis Mitchell was not considered, Mitchell was considered more of a showman than a great drummer, uh, but he really knew how to, you know, get an audience. Uh, uh, I discovered him, where, I mean, my next film is uh, about the Flatiron Building, the history of the Flatiron Building, and the Flatiron Building had a restaurant, and, and in 1912, uh, Mitchell, it was very unusual for a black musician to play in an upscale uh, French uh, restaurant, and uh, Irving Berlin uh, was one of the people he met there, and Berlin suggested to him that uh, he try to go to France and uh, or Paris because they hadn't heard the music. So he actually went to England and Paris. But uh, 
Anyway, that's, uh, that's Lewis uh, Mitchell. Uh, Arthur Briggs, another fascinating story. Uh, Arthur Briggs uh, was in uh, Paris during uh, World War II, the beginning of World War II, when oh, most blacks fled. But he stayed and was arrested by the Nazis and put into a work camp. Uh, and in the work camp, uh, as soon as he got there, he started an orchestra of other, you know, other people in the camp. And they started this jazz orchestra. I think he had to shut it down at one time and then started another one. And, uh, and these were classical jazz musicians, people learning jazz. Uh, uh, the, the commandant of the concentration camp was a, a closet jazz fan, so that he was protected and ultimately uh, got out. That's just, the same thing is true in, in, in Paris during the occupation. Uh, the Germans didn't really ban jazz. They just banned Americans from uh, anyone who were American uh, jazz. Uh, and also, uh, so there, there was a story about how uh, some of the French uh, musicians uh, changed jazz standards into French titles, you know, uh, the same songs, you know, we know, and they would uh, give them French titles so that they could tell the uh, Gestapo they were playing uh, Europe, world music, they weren't playing American music, and that seemed to have, uh, that seems to have gotten, gotten by. But uh, this, this is how it all started, uh, the 369th, uh, led by um, the uh, Chestnut. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the group uh, uh, was, was able to, to, to uh, perform, I mean, they performed throughout France. And they didn't just go to Paris. I mean, they were actually, um, they actually traveled 2,000 miles uh, in the, uh, throughout the countryside in France, going from town to town, uh, playing jazz. So this was one of the ways that jazz, uh, jazz was in, in, introduced. Uh, James Reese Europe, I said Chestnut, the, uh, the leader was, this is another interesting story, James Reese Europe was a college educated musician, was the most popular jazz musician in New York, maybe one of the most popular musicians. He played for a white society. There's actually footage from 1915 with him playing uh, in Bridgehampton for a social uh, group. Uh, and he recorded, he was just a, a major, major figure in, on the New York scene and the New York uh, jazz scene. But he thought it was important for African Americans uh, uh, to join the military because he thought he was very patriotic, but he also thought that uh, it was a character building thing that. Uh, that they should, uh, you know, partake of. And um, the last thing is this band was actually uh, put together because the American officers wanted the New York to have the best, this is 369th and right, the best band, because uh, Chicago had a pretty good band. And so they recruited, there were ads in the uh, black newspapers throughout the country recruiting uh, musicians uh, in Europe, because uh, Europe was, was so prominent. And, uh, uh, so anyway, there were a lot of there were a lot of really talented people uh, uh, in in the group, and uh, on the military side, you know, they lost about half of their uh, unit. I mean, you know, about a thousand members were uh, were lost uh, in the, in the combat uh, as well. So I'd like now to uh, this is a group. These, these are some of the musicians uh, in uh, pa you know who were in Paris. They were they posed. Uh, there was a benefit and. Uh, a lot of the black musicians uh, posed, and there were some really uh, prominent people uh, there there at that time. I think we have uh, one more picture. Okay, this is the last one. This is this is our group uh, led by Victor Goings, extraordinary uh, musician. So uh, what we did was we uh, we put together a band. Uh, we tried. We we had uh, Goings did charts that were similar to the charts. The music played. Everything was researched. This was a French-American co-production, so we actually took them to Paris. We filmed in Paris. We had top French musicians uh, playing with us, and French scholars, uh, uh, the NEH, uh, gave us a, a large grant, as well as the, the National Endowment for the City Arts. So we tried to be as accurate as possible. Uh, so I'd like now to uh, start with the, uh, the a clip of the film and uh, We'll be here for uh, qu questions and answers. This is actually Fats Waller, uh, who was at uh, 
Bricktop. Bricktop was called Bricktop because uh, she had red, her red hair, and a very bright red, and she was very light-skinned and had bright red hair, so, okay. Paris is a place where you could really, first of all, be yourself in public and find that that was value. And also there was a feeling that African Americans were seen as a kind of, well, people that were symbols of good times. I was in Harlem in the 1920s. I saw the excitement of the Renaissance there, but Paris was even more exciting. The whole city was like a great big ongoing celebration. World War I had been all too real to the French. Now that it was over, they wanted to forget all that heartache. They wanted to party and dance. <laughs> Anytime you walk down the streets, you'd run into four or five people you knew. Performers, entertainers, all kinds of people who had real talent in them. You'd start to go home, and you would never get there. There was always some singer to hear or someone who was playing. It seemed like you couldn't get home before 10 or 11 in the morning. Sidney Bechet. Born in 1897... Sidney Boucher left New Orleans as a touring musician at age 19. He became well-known on both sides of the Atlantic, as famous for his mercurial temperament as for his virtuoso playing. If there was ever a person in jazz whose personality was manifested in their music, that person would have been Sidney Bechet. Everything about him, you can hear inside of his music, his feisty, fiery personality. In early New Orleans music, usually the trumpet player was the leader. But in Sidney Bechet's group, he was the leader of his band. He played the melody, and everybody else played around him. It's really important that we include a song like Careless Love in the music of W.C. Handy because he's the father of the blues. And jazz music starts with the blues. And Careless Love, even though it isn't a blues, it is a piece that evokes the sound of the blues in the way it is performed. Indispensable to the nightlife of Montmartre was Georgia-born Eugene Bullard, 
As a boy, Bullard ran away from Southern racial violence and eventually made his way to Paris. Well, you never saw or heard of such a successful nightclub. People felt they had to come to Zellers. It was the only place in Paris that was open all night, and everybody who was anybody went there. Bullard started life in Paris as a drummer, but his talent for social connections soon made him a nightclub manager at Zellies in Montmartre. As Sidney Bechet said, Eugene Bullard was a real man about Paris. He had a way. If someone needed help, he did more than any Salvation Army could with a whole army. The cabarets, the clubs, the musicians, when there was some trouble they couldn't straighten out by themselves, they called on Jean. He made himself the kind of man people around Paris had a need for. Eugene Bullard is proof that in Paris in the 1920s, the possibilities for self-definition were limited only by the imagination. Here's a young African-American from the South who is attracted to the idea of Paris, the idea of that great modern city, the idea of a place where you could be yourself, find yourself, discover yourself. As a teenager, Bullard had stowed away on a German merchant ship. Discovered and put to work, he used the time wisely and picked up German. He joined a touring vaudeville troupe in England and even became a successful boxer, arriving in Paris in 1913. From the first day I set foot in France, I became aware of the working of the miracle within me. I was suddenly free, free to merely be a man. He loved France and vowed never to leave. Bullard joined the French Foreign Legion as World War I began. Wounded at the Battle of Verdun, he was awarded the highest French military honor, the Croix de Guerre, and declared unfit for further infantry service. Bullard next turned his sights to aviation. In those days when aviation was young, the planes we flew were known as chicken coops, or as the French call them, cajapoul. Many of them were held together with wire and heavy glue. In September 1918, Eugene Bullard received orders to fly his first combat mission, the first ever by a pilot of African descent. The eyes of the world were watching me. I had to do or die, and I didn't want to die. Bullard flew at least 20 missions for the French and received several more military awards, None of this was reported in America. When he applied for transfer to the U.S. Air Corps to fly for his own country, he learned that black pilots were not accepted by the American military. James Reese Europe was widely known in America as a conductor and a pioneering advocate for black musicians' unions. During World War I, Europe was commissioned as a lieutenant under Colonel William Hayward. Hayward asked him to recruit the best damn band in the United States Army. And the Harlem Hellfighters Band arrived in France as part of the 369th Infantry Division on January 1, 1918. They were greeted with tremendous enthusiasm everywhere as American soldiers in general were, but they they brought this new sound. What was really important about James Reese is that they didn't play the rhythm the way previous bands had played it. They would say to rag the rhythm as opposed to just playing it straight. They would add a little something to it. When they played in Paris, they played opposite the most prominent French military band. The musicians in that French band wanted to examine the instruments in James Reese Europe's orchestra because they thought there was some kind of trick instruments because of the way they were able to play.
Imagine being a French person who's interested in music, and all of a sudden you hear somebody playing an instrument that sounds like their voice. It sounds like somebody talking to you on an instrument with all the nuances of a verbal expression. That's a shock. The Harlem Hellfighters band traveled 2,000 miles to entertain audiences in 25 French cities. They made friends everywhere. Their regiment fought under French commanders in segregated units. A black soldier in the American army could perform manual labor, but was not permitted to kill a white enemy. Those who did see combat had to be assigned to French commanders. Under the leadership of the French army, the 369th were given the distinction of leading the charge to the Rhine, which was the final offensive that secured the Allied victory. The division lost 800 of its 2,000 men. We were under fire for a period of 191 days. It was hell, but those boys faced the music. Every mother's son of them stood up and fought like a tiger. I'm very proud of them. They're clean, brave men, fearing nothing. Colonel William Hayward. More than 350,000 black Americans served in the U.S. Army in World War I. They were honored in France and for a time celebrated back home. New York's finest avenue was the scene of a triumph. Looking at their faultless ranks, stretching in perfect alignment from curb to curb, their dignified soldierly bearing. It was hard to believe that less than two years ago, many of these bemetalled veterans were parlor car porters, apartment house helpers, restaurant waiters, bellboys, and whatnot. New York Herald Tribune. It was a great day for one young private. The feeling was terrific. Everybody was happy. It was the most wonderful day of my life, the day we marched up Fifth Avenue. That's the one day that there wasn't the slightest bit of prejudice in New York City. That day. The black experience in World War I changed a lot of things in giving the black soldiers and the wider black population a sense of the wider world and a sense of possibility. But these victories were not permanent triumphs. The summer of 1919, after World War I, was one of the worst summers in American history in terms of the resurgence of racially motivated violence. There were race riots. Uh, there were lynchings that swept across the U.S. It's not for nothing that that summer is known as the Red Summer. A lot of those people lynched were actually soldiers. They were specifically targeted because it was fear that they would be bringing new ideas, unwelcome ideas, back to the South. During the war, many African Americans had come from the South to work in the war industries. With soldiers coming back now, there was increased competition for these jobs between African American communities and white communities. And those sparked major race riots in cities like Chicago, most notably in Washington, D.C. But the message that was given to African Americans was very clear. This is not going to represent a new day for you in America. Things are not going to be different. Things are going to remain the same, and if you protest that, your life will be forfeit. Black Americans responded in varying ways to racial oppression. Some remained in the South and struggled to survive. Others sought equality in the North, and still others resisted under the banner of a militant new Negro. A small number of black artists, musicians, and intellectuals who lived or fought in France went back to Paris. Others, hearing about the freedom of life there, decided to follow them. 
There was a hit song in the early 1920s, just after World War I. How are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? And it's not just about the black experience in the war, but it was, uh, for black audiences, all about the black experience in the war. How you gonna keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? How you gonna keep them away from Broadway, dancing around and painting the town? How you gonna keep them away from harm? That's the mystery. They'll never want to see a rake of plow. And who's a deuce and poly boo a cow? You listen to the lyrics when they come back to the farm, how are they gonna say parlez-vous to a cow? Could you imagine a future as a sharecropper after you'd seen the Eiffel Tower or the Arc de Triomphe? And it's a silly song, but the song is about the fact that you can't go back. And that was a simple, profound truth for African Americans coming out of World War I in 1919, that they had seen something they had heard stories of a life and the possibility of a freedom that made it impossible for them to accept uh, the way things had been before. Black musicians experienced not only personal and artistic freedom in Paris, they were now making more money than they ever could at home, and their music was getting attention from the French avant-garde. The French avant-garde was looking for something very new and looking for something that was outside of France. And jazz was one of those places where they found it. Jazz was seen by the most advanced French musicians as very daring, as very innovative. It really combines auditory images of both modernity and spontaneity. Man Ray's film, Cine Poème, adopted an improvisational style. It looked like jazz. French members of the avant-garde, like the American expatriate photographer Man Ray, Jean Cocteau, the composer Darius Milleau, they clearly thought that jazz and the artistic experimentation that they were involved in represented to them the avenue that they wanted to pursue in their own art. Jean Cocteau said, we should aspire to create a literature that is as much like jazz as uh, a cocktail is like jazz. The French avant-garde lost interest in jazz artists once they became too popular. So One sensational entertainer was already the toast of Paris nightlife, Josephine Baker. Before going to Paris in the summer of 1925, Josephine Baker was making $125 a week in chocolate dandies. But of course, we should not forget, she could not go and try a hat. She didn't go in a shop and try shoes. You had to go to the color sections. So when she arrived in Paris, and she saw that suddenly, everybody embraced her. And was even more nicer to her because of the color of her skin. Then, it's like getting drunk, getting high. You understand you could go try a hat at the Galerie Lafayette in Paris. You could go in any restaurant. At that period, 90% of African Americans lived in the South, where any misstep and you could find yourself on the wrong end of a rope. So to come to Paris then, where all of a sudden black skin was not only not a problem, but in many ways valued, was simply unbelievable for a lot of these people. And it took them a while to get used to it. In the United States, the black woman who is of a certain class has to act a certain way. Um, and so one can go to Paris and kind of, you know, get buck wild and <laughs> sell so in the way that Josephine Baker did. Driven by dark forces I didn't recognize, I improvised. Each time I leaped, I seemed to touch the sky, and when I regained Earth, it seemed to be mine alone. I felt intoxicated. Among the 2,000 people in the theater, half of them left saying that black American and jazz would destroy the white civilization. 
Josephine Baker became a big star before she was even full grown. She would ask me about everything. She said, Bricky, tell me what to do. <laughs> I became her big sister. She wouldn't even go around the corner without asking my advice. Eugene Bullard hired Ada Bricktop Smith all the way from New York to be a hostess and singer at his new club, La Grand Duke. Bullard had heard that she knew the business and could also charm the clientele. She was named Bricktop because of her red hair. The legend is that she comes to Montmartre. She's employed, first of all, in Eugene Bullard's nightclub. She enters the club and immediately bursts into tears because compared to the club she's seen in New York, it's very small and sort of dowdy. And a young busboy sort of settles her down, gives her somebody to drink and dries her tears and says it's going to be okay. And that young busboy was, of course, Langston Hughes. The Grand Duke is about a dozen tables and a bar. Part of what she would do as a hostess or a saloon entertainer, as she liked to call herself, is provide that glue in the various parts of the social scene in front of her. She would find a way for, whether it's passing the champagne bottle or whether it's singing, she would navigate that space and make connections among the aristocrats, the American millionaires, the American middle-class tourists, and the black performers in this very small 12-table club. By the late 1920s, Bricktop had bought her own club. Bricktop was a very gifted businesswoman in some respects and then other respects not so gifted a businesswoman because she did burn through a lot of clubs. She was prone to extravagance. But certainly she made enough money. She was one of the few black Americans who were able to buy property um, in France, and that is no small feat. Business was good, and Bricktop moved up to a larger club. Her clientele included the biggest names of the day, Cole Porter, Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and the Prince of Wales. Bricktop's was the end place in Montmartre. If you're going to appreciate jazz, Bricktops was the place, because for them, what Bricktop represented was authenticity, a kind of authentic black Americanness that one couldn't get at certain other clubs. One of the new hit songs from the Broadway musical Shuffle Along was I'm Just Wild About Harry. Walmart nightclubs at the end of the night, which is to say the beginning of the morning, after everybody else had gone home, would then hold impromptu jazz sessions. These were literally oftentimes over breakfast, but that's where you would hear the best jazz. Musicians would get together and get into battle in those late night sessions and play a hot type of jazz that was real fire. In the daytime, a musician might think, I'm just wild about Harry, but when they got together that night, they were gonna let you know how wild about Harry they really were. Trouble, you do do. It was just lively. It was an opportunity for the musicians to really let each other know who was playing the best jazz in the world at that particular point in time.
the same neighborhood where Brick Tops was located, just across the street, was Eugene Bullard's Le Grand Duke. A few blocks away was Josephine Baker's Shea Josephine. And Sidney Bechet touring around Europe was in demand in all the clubs when he was in Paris. Part of what made the neighborhood exciting, you had all these musics, all these cultures right next to each other. You had a jazz club down the street from a club where you could listen to Begin from Martinique, or Rumba from Cuba, or Argentinian tango. Paris where the aristocracy, where the rich, went to slum. As a neighborhood, Montmartre in this period was still pretty rough and tumble. You had arguments about who was going to get paid and how much and when. You had arguments about who was going out with who and who was going to go home tonight with whom. Uh, that meant that there were tensions that sometimes spilled out into the street. They sometimes spilled out into violence. On one occasion, the hot-tempered Sidney Bechet got into more trouble than he bargained for. Some of what came to me, there was a good feeling to it, and some, it was poor. When I was playing at Shea Florence, I got myself into real trouble on account of a bad feeling. Early one morning in 1928, Sidney Boucher and a black American banjo player named Mike McKendrick had a gunfight on the Rue Fontaine near Bricktop's old club. They almost killed two women passing by. Boucher and McKendrick were arrested, but Eugene Bullard bailed Boucher out of jail. Weeks later, Boucher was convicted, sentenced to 15 months in prison, and ordered to leave France after the completion of his prison term. This is an aspect of black culture, of American culture, that the French did not want to see coming to their city. And at this point, they were, willing to, they were more than ready to clamp down on anybody that they saw as responsible. So even though Bechet was quite popular, it meant he had to leave the city for some time to come. In the African-American newspapers in the 1920s, there was a continual obsession with black life in Paris. The Jamaican novelist and political activist Claude McKay sends back an article about a late night session at the Grand Duke and the singer Florence Embry Jones. After she performs, she goes up to him and says, hello, I know you think we're just here having a good time, uh, but I want you to know that we are doing our small part. We haven't forgotten what's going on in the States. Uh, he says, what do you mean? And she goes behind the bar to a small room uh, in the back of the club and comes out with a whole pile of African-American periodicals and magazines. And he was thrilled because it had been more than a year since he'd seen any African-American newspapers. What I love about the anecdote is that these clubs in Montmartre weren't just performance spaces. They weren't just spaces of encounter. They weren't just spaces of seduction. But they were a lending library, too, right? Connecting an African-American community, not just with the best of what the music was, but with what was going on in everyday life level back in Harlem, back in Chicago, back in Washington, DC. <laughs> But their artistic life had by now become grounded in Paris. For the rich patrons who could afford the spectacular reviews, the star attraction was still Josephine Baker. Josephine Baker was a free-floating signifier of what one could be in Paris. For most African Americans who traveled to France to see Josephine Baker, there was a certain pride. Um, that here was this black woman uh, whose beauty was exalted in certain ways, uh, even if it was troubling. And so there's a certain pride there, but there's also a certain repression that is operating as well because one is, for so long, had to police their own sexuality lest it reflect poorly on the race. 
Some black intellectuals were uncomfortable with black American behavior in Paris. In the article Exotic Puppets, Jane Nardal criticized Josephine Baker, saying that she reinforced French stereotypes of black women as primitive, exotic sexual beings. The Nardal sisters were from Martinique in the French Caribbean, and they were universally educated, very upper class, and they were horrified by the specter of a Josephine Baker. Jane Nardal is really trying to get at um, uh, how blacks in general are frozen uh, into these stereotypes and how they're allowed, how, the, how they're regurgitated in different, at different times and different moments. Um, and in, in this particular case, they're put to use to, to frame um, the French fascination with um, blackness. The famous banana skirt, which soon became one of her trademark legends, was, as the literary critic Phyllis Rose has put it, a perfect mingling of sexuality and primitivism. The stiff, erect banana hung around this woman's, uh, or this girl's, waist. And so, absolutely, she does feed into French, especially French masculine fantasies about the colonies. The 1931 colonial exposition in the Bois de Vincennes when the French celebrated the colonial world. You see what incredible pride the French felt, the depth of their belittlement of cultures around the world and their sense that they owned, controlled, managed, packaged their own colonial empire. The same time that the French were making an effort to welcome the African-American expatriate or the African-American artist, to say there's no racial prejudice here, to critique American racism left and right, to say, oh, lynching, we're so disturbed at what goes on in the U.S. South, but at the same time to forget conveniently what was going on in Indochina, where there were the same levels of violent repression. Uh, or in parts of French West Africa. In many of her stage performances and films, Josephine Baker is a representative of the colonialist fantasies of the French, especially the fantasies of colonial women of color as alluring, sensual, and ultimately in love with French men. Princess Tam Tam in particular. She certainly acts out the sexuality the woman who needs to be guided, who needs to be educated. She embodies the French civilizing mission or what the civilized, civilizing mission is there to do. So the film itself transports people to these various places and they could see the natives at play and why the French presence is so necessary there. Beginning with her 1928 European and South American tour, Josephine Baker began taking her career more seriously. She studied voice, learned fluent French, and integrated both French and Spanish songs into her performances. To add to this new aura of sophistication, she even studied ballet. She came back in 1930, and she opened at Le Casino de Paris. And after the opening night, where she's a leading lady of 120 people in the show. The same critic who in 25 has said she would destroy the white civilization, now we're complaining that the little negress was gone and replaced by a sophisticated Parisian. I was tired of my bananas and so was the press. Yes, I was giving my all on stage, but was I paying my dues in the real world? An obligation we must all assume someday. But Josephine Baker's hard-won elegance now played against the background of the growing depression. The glitter of Parisian nightlife was fading. By 1931-1932, the scene in the Montmartre Jazz Club industry was definitely hurting. Times were not as good as they had been. 
One of the reasons for this is, of course, the departure of wealthy Americans who had long provided much of the clientele. Even Bricktop, who had been uh, tremendously prosperous during the 1920s, is now beginning to feel the pressure. Some of my best clients wrote little notes marked personal, asking to borrow 3,000 or 5,000 francs. It was hard for me to understand this, because while I was in their world, I was not part of it. I could understand being broke, but it seemed strange that people who used to have all the money in the world were suddenly pressed for a few dollars. In Montmartre, musicians, artists, and club owners struggled to survive. Opportunities for black musicians had become scarce. There was a more mainstream jazz in the United States. I'd like, um, sorry to have to cut it, but I'd like to have a bit of a q and I guess we have to be out of here. Who would like to start? Anybody with a question? Bricktop came back, didn't she? And um, was for a long time living in obscurity in, here in New York or in Roosevelt Island or someplace as a, as a nurse or, and then got rediscovered when she was well in her 80s. Is that correct? Or did, no, that wasn't. Oh, was, that was Alberta Hunter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. what Bricktop happened to, opened what happened clubs to in Rome. Uh, and uh, I guess she had uh, another club. Uh, was she in England? But she, she opened up... Uh, other clubs. She did come back, uh, and ultimately, uh, she, uh, Jim Haskins uh, published her biography. Her, or her biography, and uh, yeah, she, she, and she was somewhat, in, you know, she wasn't as known. Uh, but you know, Woody Allen uh, put her in uh, one of his movies. I think she was in Zelig or one of Woody's uh, films. Uh, uh, so yeah, she she did come back. This would probably require another afternoon, but would you have a few words about the influence on American popular music? Well, the influ Well, I can say that. I mean, because France, Paris was so important uh, in in world culture, uh, the success of these musicians in Paris helped to make other Europeans take jazz seriously as a, as an art form. So you know, things happen in Paris; they're accepted in Paris. So. Uh, uh, that that was important. Uh, I, I wouldn't say the greatest jazz in the world was necessarily created in in Paris uh, uh, during 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 that period. But the greatest jazz musicians came over Ellington, Armstrong. You know, they were all they were all re revered. Uh, Ra you know, Reinhardt was important. Uh, Coleman Hawkins. I mean, some of the greatest names uh, played there. But the scene was. Uh, was was more a kind of a commercial scene uh, uh, in the clubs. Uh, actually, with the term Harlem and Montmartre, uh, some blacks, because there were so many black artists in Paris, called the Paris scene uh, uh, Black Paris or Harlem and Montmartre. That's how they referred to the uh, the kind of jazz uh, club scene uh, in, in Paris. Um, you know, certainly Berlin, certainly uh, we, in the film, we actually look at art. We look at uh, the writers who were there, you know, the painters who were influenced uh, also by jazz. Uh, but in terms of the American pop scene, I'm not sure. First of all, thank you so much. Uh, I have a, a question in terms, just in terms of film. Uh, Eugene Bullard, who I just recently discovered, seems to be an awfully uh, dramatic character that just begs to have a film done about him and, and just shown, particularly to uh, uh, young black men, to know that a person like him existed. And I, I, I know when he returned and, and things weren't you know, quite as good for him, but still, he's just a monumental figure. And then um, the question I have is um, about Florence Mills. Uh, predating Josephine Baker and 
the sensation that she caused. And then uh, just one statement in terms of the influence of music. James Reese Europe was the band leader for Irene and Vernon Castle, the dance duo that um, Fred and Ginger did a movie about them. But he was, he was their um, musical director and, and played for them. Sure, I totally agree. Uh, Bullard, uh, and I've seen that film. Uh, the Museum of Modern Art has it made in 1915 with the, with the castle. Uh, Bullard's, uh, Bullard did get some recognition. I should have pointed out that when Bullard was flying for the French, the State Department wrote letters in the official documents to uh, the French military saying, you've got to ground him. You've got to, you know, it's, it's just demoralizing to the American military that this guy is flying. Uh, and then there was a, uh, a film, a feature film, that came out a couple of years ago uh, called Flyboys. It was a French-American uh, film. Did anyone see that film, Flyboys? Well, the black pilot in that film was Bullard. Uh, it was you know, based on, somewhat based on Bullard. Uh, we tried to get permission, but his family, uh, his grandson uh, was alive, but he wouldn't give us permission. We tried to develop something. Uh, on Bullard. Uh, the Air and Space Museum did a special tribute to Bullard in Washington. So they did a major, uh, a major tribute to him about three or four uh, years ago. And thank God, you know, th th there is documentation for all his, all his exploits. And then the, towards the end of his life, he worked at Radio City Music Hall. He was an op elevator operator, you know, and he had all these medals, you know. <laughs> And someone did the research, and they discovered that these are real medals, and he was a French war hero. Uh, he actually went back to France. He was honored again in France. Uh, he was also in intelligence during World War II and was wounded again in World, 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 War, World War II. Uh, the Today Show, someone got the word to Dave Garraway, and they interviewed James uh, Eugene Bullard on the Today Show. It's one of the few segments on the Today Show that does not exist. Uh, you, know, and they, you know, they keep very good records. That one doesn't, uh, doesn't exist. Uh, there was a press blackout uh, when Boulard was flying, so not even the black press uh, wrote about uh, Boulard's exploits. That's one of the reasons uh, that uh, he's you know, not, not widely known. Yes, during that time, um, uh, when they had the artists the, the, uh, in France, you know, the artists and poets and sculptors and writers and very fertile time, did the, the black jazz musicians, uh, did they mingle with the rest of the... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah. They didn't stay among yeah. their... <laughs> no, yeah, no, 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 because... Uh, Blacks, even you know, and, and I remember in the in the fifties, people going to uh, Paris and you know going to brick tops. Yeah, you had to. Uh, but there were incidents of white uh, Southerners. I'm not saying all Southerners, but who got into fights because they would see an, a, an interracial couple uh, or get into a club and get angry, uh, you know, at how the French were treating these 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 African Americans. Uh, uh, but it should be pointed out that these clubs were expensive. You know, they they were. Oh, there's a, there's a wonderful story. It's not in the film about Edith Piaf. Uh, she was uh, Bricktop was at another uh, restaurant having dinner, and she saw Edith Piaf, and uh, she asked the waiter, "Could I be introduced?" So she went over to her Edith Piaf's table, and Edith Piaf said, "Oh, Bricktop, I know who you are." She said, "I was uh, outside. I was begging outside of your club." <laughs> because I was too young uh, to get in, uh, but certainly uh, I, I know who you are and you know, appreciate uh, you know what you've done. Uh, could you say a few words about uh, Josephine Baker's activities in World War II? Why she got her medals? Yeah, she she um, she was able you know socially she was able to go to parties and listen uh, to uh, diplomats uh, you know. And here, the Germans, you know, discussing uh, things. And then she kept these little slips of paper. She talks about her because uh, she didn't think anyone would dare uh, to, to, to search her. Uh, 
But she, in her biography, and the French talk about that. Ballard uh, ran. Ballard was amazing. After after the cl clubs, because the French jazz musicians wanted to play uh, jazz uh, too, Ballard opened up a health club, a, a sport club, and it was a huge success <laughs> in in Paris. Uh, and uh, he then opened up a restaurant, which the, a lot of German officers uh, frequented. And while they were, you know, there, they never would think, you know, they were all French waiters, and this black man could understand German, so he was definitely connected to the uh, French intelligence. And then, uh, and then he had to leave, and and uh, he was wounded, uh, and they did come back, wounded for the, the third time, and managed to escape. And when he came back, oh, well, you heard the story about there was no place for him. The uh, the U.S. person at uh, immigration said. Uh, we have all the other Americans they had uh, hotel rooms for, and, uh, and not for him. Huh. You mentioned that his wife was French. Who was she? I think um, one of the musicians actually married a Michelin. Uh, I'm forgetting. Uh, the uh, the name of the family, but uh, I th the uh, father was a, you know was a count, and this helped. See, also when he was in the air force, uh, there were all these sort of upper class f young Frenchmen. Uh, so he got, got friendly, you know, air force those who survived because so many of them were killed. So he had a real connection to these families and was able to. In fact, his wife came over uh, uh, with him to the. Uh, to the, to, to the States. But that was why he was able to open up doors, because he spoke French, he had these social connections. What a smart guy, I mean, just... Uh, and uh, also Arthur Briggs uh, married uh, a French woman, and she was still alive up until two years. Briggs, who was, who was in the work camp and had the band, uh, but she never really, she wouldn't let us interview her. Uh, <clears throat> was Duke Ellington very, very active in the Paris circle? I, I remember him here in 1937, but did he have an active life in Paris? He did. Uh, he did. I, I remember there's a, uh, later in the film, uh, there's a, they recall a 37 uh, concert, uh, Ellington, and uh, how the French had just never heard <laughs> this kind of, you know, this kind of orchestra and you know uh, he they loved him some of the there's some wonderful films the French you know obviously they worked and they were very successful uh, but remember our story goes only to about 49 uh, but yes he, he he loved Paris and they loved him and he had a, a wonderful time there but he didn't settle Armstrong actually did uh, Armstrong uh, was escaping uh, mobsters uh, in the States, he had this, you know, uh, crooked, this manager, and so the Chicago mob was, was after him. So that's, uh, so he actually took, for the first time in his career, the only time, he took a six month vacation in Paris. Uh, and he, he also came to some of the clubs, but he was just kind of hiding out, and, and then he went to Denmark. Uh, uh, we found a piece of footage, we didn't use it, uh, it's about a minute and a half that was. Actually, I found it at the Jazz Museum in Kansas City. It was about a minute and a half of Armstrong in a night, Paris nightclub that was never, ever seen. Ne people never knew it existed. I mean, if you go to... It's, we're not sure how, what to do with it, because if you put it on TV, everybody has it. Uh, but no, Ellington, uh, Armstrong uh, were there. Is Boulard's grandson French or American, and can you tell us what his objection is? to having a film made about his grandfather? He didn't talk to, he, he said basically that he had a contract with someone else about a film about his grandfather. But this is like, it goes back about eight years. I, we wondered whether it was Flyboys, but, uh, but which doesn't really, I mean, which is good. I mean, it does show you what they did, but it's, doesn't, it's really a fictionalized version of him. So we never really, uh, he wouldn't speak to us really, and then he wouldn't, you know, couldn't get back to us. His biographer is in Paris, and uh, 
we interview him later in the in the in the film. Uh, but they're you know I think he's in Philadelphia. The uh, the family. Prior to uh, World War One, why do you think jazz caught on sooner in France rather than Germany? I'm not sure. I, I know that you know the. I know there was a, a scene uh, also in Hong Kong because of the uh, the ships, the uh, cruise ships, you know, and musicians could. This is later could could gig, uh, but the Germans. Uh, were very serious, you know, and of course today jazz, jazz lovers. I'm not sure about the early period, even though I studied there uh, about in Germany and why. But uh, but the, the 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 Nazis had a contradictory view of jazz. I mean, because a lot of the officers loved loved it, and uh, there's stories about musicians uh, being productive as well as getting killed. You know, uh, but no, I, I I don't really have a clear answer uh, to that question. Last question. Last question. The last and first question, the same questioner. Come full circle. Sure. Um, talkies came in the late 20s, is that correct? Yes. And yet we saw footage here, or maybe this is the difference between music uh, in earlier f otherwise silent films and then talkies. <laughs> And so the footage we saw from 1918 with, um, I'm assuming that was live recorded at the moment, is, am I... Yeah, no, no, you're, you're very sure, yeah. Uh, that was James Reese Europe, that 1918. But we, we, that recording was James Reese Europe, an actual James Reese recording, but it wasn't sound on film. It was just, uh, we added a, a recording. Yes, of course, there wasn't sound uh, in that period. But I, I just, I've seen that footage a hundred times of the uh, French and British officers watching these uh, black Americans uh, play music, and I just, it's just fascinating. And then, the, uh, uh, but before I conclude, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, Shannon Lynn, who uh, works with Vanguard, does research, and is a graduate student uh, at the New School. And uh, I'd like to do a little commercial. Uh, in July, I'll be doing a, a workshop uh, under, uh, with art, uh, Workshop International. Uh, they're celebrating their 30th year, and uh, it'll be in Assisi, Italy. Not just me. I mean, there'll be quite a lot of uh, writers and painters, uh, many uh, very distinguished people who have worked with them. So, if you, I'll leave a notice here. So, if anyone wants to spend two weeks in a five-star hotel in uh, Assisi, Italy, uh, and study, they don't just have to study you know, painting. I'll, I'll be doing a seminar on on documentary film uh, uh, there. So again, I'd like to thank the, the new school and Miriam, Gloria, everyone. <laughs>